one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Therefore, nobody can represent you to God. You are your own priest. And therefore, you have the opportunity in these few moments before we study the Word to represent yourself to God, to speak to Him as you would to anyone else. He is anxiously waiting for your communication. You approach not in your own goodness. You approach not in your own worthiness. But you approach because... You are in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the second person of the Godhead, God the Son. And therefore, because since you are in Christ, you have a royal priesthood, and you can approach the throne of grace at any time. It is wise for you to confess all known sins so that you may be taught by the Holy Spirit at this time. Let us pray. Once again, Father, it is our privilege and honor to study the Word. May God the Holy Spirit help us to appreciate these things which we can extrapolate from it and look forward to that day when we know that our faith will be sight. We will leave behind this veil of tears and enter into the presence of the King of Kings forevermore. Glorify God the Son. Help believers to be encouraged, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I will never understand why it is that believers in Jesus Christ look on death as the worst thing that could happen to them. While none of us likes to say goodbye, it's inevitable. It's part of life. Now, it seems, however, that sometimes... When you're young, you don't think about death except as a way out of problems. And that death becomes a suicide attempt to get away from problems. And it's, of course, the coward's way out. Romanism teaches that if you commit suicide, you can't go to heaven, but they don't have any basis for that. If you're saved by grace through faith in Christ, you will go to heaven regardless of how you check out of this life. Because it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy that He saves us. We're saved not by anything we do or don't do. And how you check out of this life is between you and God. The best way is to wait for Him. But one of the interesting things uh, that I do at my age is to Always read the obituaries. I figure if my name isn't there, I have another day left at least. And so I go on. But uh, I, I, what I, what I look, look at are the ages of the people who've died. I, don't, I look to see if there's anybody there that I knew or know. Or I guess I don't know them anymore. They knew, I knew them until they, their name appeared in the obituary column. And then I say, oh, isn't it amazing? So-and-so just died. Yeah. But I look at the ages, and what amazes me is that uh, while there are maybe a few days and, uh, per month in which most of the ages are 80, 83, I'm, sh I'm surprised at the number of young ages, teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, the number of those who die. Uh, one thing is sure, beloved, unless the rapture takes place, you're going to die. You're going you're gonna to one day, somebody's going to find you laying there in the ground. Now, how about that fellow, fellow in, in, who was the other day out hunting, and he was up hunting deer on the top of a platform? 45 years of age, had a heart attack. Zap, fell off the thing, was dead. They, his family wondered why he didn't come back. 45 years of age. Listen, these things have no bearing on anything. There's nobody who has any guarantee. Like the fellow said, uh, he said, I... I don't have anything to worry about. A psychic told me I would live till 93. And his friend said, does that mean 93 years or 1993? And he went, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, huh? What's it going to be? You don't know. Nobody has a guarantee of tomorrow. Our days are numbered. But the Bible tells us it is appointed on a man once to die. 
Now, there is no general judgment. By that I mean uh, people have the idea that when you die, you stand before some kind of a judgment uh, bar, and God determines whether you go to heaven or you go to hell. And that is not true. There is no such thing. Those who have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ are already passed from death to life, and they are assured of heaven, they are guaranteed of heaven, regardless of what happens. The person who has rejected Christ, rejected Christ, has until his last breath to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Jesus Christ hung on the cross, there were two thieves that hung with him. And one uh, went to hell, the other went to heaven. And this uh, unbaptized, unchurched, uh, unrepentant uh, 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 thief simply recognized who Jesus Christ was and believed on Christ. And in that moment of time, he was saved. And Jesus said to him, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That blows it for everybody that says you've got to belong to a church to go to heaven. That blows it for everyone that says you have to be baptized to go to heaven. Or do, any, or do good things to go to heaven. This guy didn't have a chance to do a thing. No time. Went to be with the Lord. Now, it's going to be by grace, as we've been talking about. Unearned and undeserved, by grace all the way. Now, the thing is, for years I wondered, what in the world are we going to do in heaven? What is going to be the occupation of believers once we get there? I know that there have been all kinds of pictures and movies. One thing is sure, you're not going to be an angel. I hope you understand that. The angels are not human beings who go to heaven and get a set of wings. Nor do you earn your wings by doing some kind of good deeds down here on the earth. Uh, that's what some movie makers have, have done. They have uh, painted that kind of a picture, you know. That uh, so-and-so can't get into heaven until he comes and earns his wing. And that story, uh, the, one of the great Christmas stories with Jimmy Stewart, uh, who wishes he was never born, is aided by the angel, and whenever they hear a, you hear a bell at Christmas, it's an angel getting his wings. That's very sentimental and, and sweet, but it's, it's downright lie, just like Santa Claus. A downright, I know it shocks you. Uh, I, I know as a teenager nobody ever told you, but then you can go through life believing that there is a Santa Claus, and one day you may marry him, you know. Just ask this question, are you ready to treat me in a way I'd like to become accustomed? That's the question you want to ask the guy, no matter what he says. But anyway, now, uh, the angels are a unique creation, and they actually will serve us because of our position in Christ as believers. We are superior to angels. And even we all have an, an angel assigned to us right now. You can't see him, of course, because angels have a different kind of a body. But they're assigned to guard us in the angelic conflict. I think some of you need to have a guardian angel the way you drive, but then I don't think that any of them could take it. They probably would lose their wings. I've seen some of you drive. I don't know how you get out between the cars coming down the street, but I see them, I see you do it. I think you wait till they get within 30 feet and then challenge the next car to stop before it hits. Well, anyway, I, I generally wait till the line goes by. But anyway, the point is that you're not going to be an angel when you get to heaven. You are, however, going to have a resurrection body eventually, which is a brand new body. But what are you going to do? Float around heaven on a cloud wearing a robe with a harp? Golly, I hope not. No, I know that isn't the case. There's going to be a lot of things that are going on in heaven. And we were talking the other day that uh, we're getting closer to finding out whether there are going to be any dogs in heaven. Now, there's, there, we have finally found a reason to believe that. 
uh, if the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back on a white horse, there has to be white horses in heaven. And therefore, if there's a good horse, there's going to be a good dog. Because if for every good horse, there's at least two good dogs. Now, there are no c good cats, so there won't be any cats in heaven. We know that. But there are bound to be a couple of nice dogs, some real nice dogs. I I think I know a couple of them, you know. But uh, anyway, that we're getting we're, we're not ready to be dogmatic about that yet, and make a dogmatic statement. But we're close, you see, figuring a, the horse dog analogy. But uh, I'll tell you, I do know some things we are that are going to take place in heaven when we get to be with the Lord. In other words, beloved, when we when this life is over, we're not finished. There is going to be a lot of activity, and I want to share some of it with you. As a matter of fact, my study has revealed that it's going to be a place of unceasing activity. Unceasing activity. And uh, since time is so short as it compares to eternity, I'm convinced that we have a lot of living to do in eternity future. And that this period of time in which we live is just preparatory for the time that by His grace we shall look on His face as we enter into eternity future. And the first thing I am convinced of is that uh, there would not be a resurrection body unless God had a purpose for it. Furthermore, He takes the soul which He has given to us and saves it, and He gives us a new human spirit, so that now as we uh, are born again, uh, we are able to uh, fulfill His plan for this life. But, what we fulfill for this life is just very, very minuscule compared to what this is preparing us to do for all of eternity. For we have such great capacities. Uh, we have such great abilities which His grace have provided for us. And these capacities don't reach fulfillment until in this life we're just about ready to check out. And so I believe that uh, we're going to have some fantastic opportunities to develop these things. For example, the human spirit that God has given to us, uh, filled with Bible doctrine, causes us to have fellowship with Him here. But think about it in eternity future. We will have great opportunities to fellowship with God, particularly with the visible God, and that is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We, uh, we are told that we now see through a glass dimly. Uh, we are looking through uh, uh, glasses, smoke glasses, uh, that are covered over. You, can't, you can just barely see through them. And on the other side, there are just a few things. Uh, uh, we can see something about our Lord and Savior here as we study the Scripture. But we, we have no idea that nowhere in all of the Word of God is there painted a picture of what our Lord Jesus Christ looked like. We would have no idea if He was tall or short. We have no idea if He was... Uh, 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 what, what His uh, features were like, except that He was Jewish. But David was Jewish and had red hair. I mean... You, you see, because into the line of, the, of, of Messiah, uh, there was a red-headed woman. Uh, and uh, way back, she was, a, uh, she was a whore who got saved and uh, married into the family and became the great-great-grandmother, great-great-great-grandmother. Her name was Rahab. And there was a, there was a, a, a Moabitess whose name was Ruth, who was a Gentile, and she married... Boaz and became the great grandmother of, of, of David. And uh, down the line, so uh, there are some uh, 
uh, non-Jews in there who brought in some interesting uh, characteristics. And so uh, David was a, was a freak. King David, the great king of, of, of Israel, was red-haired. No, Jews aren't red-haired. They're black-haired. But David was red-haired. Everybody said, who was his... Well, anyway, <laughs> no. But any, the point being that, that uh, we're going to have fantastic fellowship, but you see, the marvels of God's character will actually be revealed before us in the presence of the Lord, when we will actually, in our resurrection body, with this fantastically saved soul and this human spirit that's just jam-packed with doctrine, now we actually see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. The songwriter said, uh, uh, when it drew the, he drew the picture uh, of... Uh, uh, the believers standing before the Lord and think and, and wanting to express their eternal gratitude for this great salvation. And uh, he says that uh, when we sing Redemption's story, the angels will fold their wings. For angels never knew the joy that our salvation brings. Angels weren't saved by the work of Christ on the cross. Only re fallen man. And so there be whatever appreciation and worship there's going to be uh, for our Lord and Savior in heaven, stop for a moment and realize that the angels will not have any part in it. And when it comes to singing the story of eternal redemption, we will be able to sing, and only we who have been saved by His matchless grace. And to worship the One who loved us and gave Himself for us. To look into the eyes and see the face of the, the God-man, Christ Jesus, who bore our sins in His own body on the tree. It should be a glorious time. The soul will have a fantastic ability and a great and a, and a fantastic field for discovery, for research, the sense of beauty, the sense of appreciation. You see, first of all, the mentality of the soul. You see, some people have said it's a shame that by the time you really learn something, you die. I mean, think of all the years that you've been, you're accumulating knowledge. You think you know it all when you're 16. You realize by the age that you're 21, as Gary said in his story, how much his parents learned between the time he got out of college. It's amazing how much your parents know. But uh, really, you don't know anything. Uh, by the time you reach real maturity, think of all the things that you've learned by experience, by study, by reading, by research, everything that you do. Well, the mentality of the soul will be totally freed in eternity future uh, to uh, uh, seek its, fant its, its own pursuits. And uh, uh, I believe there's going to be great opportunities. Uh, the, remember this that the body is going to be changed, as we talked about. The body is going to be a resurrection body. And it's, it's capable of space travel. It can, it can travel very, very rapidly and move from one place to another uh, in just a moment of time. Our Lord Jesus Christ proved that uh, because He had a resurrection body. So furthermore, it can go through solid materials. And, he, and just think of it. Uh, the... I was reading in the paper the other day that they're launching a space probe that in just a few years, six years, should tell us what Pluto's like. I don't mean the dog in, down in, uh, in uh, Disneyland or Disney World. I'm talking about the, the planet Pluto. Well, if you happen to have a bent in that direction, you could beat it there. Just by one moment of time, you can be from here to there because of your resurrection body. 
And if you're a part of those who want to know about the black holes in outer space, you can investigate those. It'll be fantastic. For your, your mentality will continue to grow. Because we do know there's going to be Bible classes in eternity, so uh, there won't be Bible classes if, if you're not going to learn anything. And so there's going to be mentality. But not only that, your emotions. The emotions are a part of the soul. But you see, here you can't trust your emotions. But in eternity future, you can trust your emotions. And your emotions will, will perceive things that they have never perceived here. Things that are, are uh, uh, so glorious and so magnificent, so wonderful, that uh, you and I can't begin to, to uh, imagine what it's like to walk on streets that are paved with transparent gold, to see a city th that has its very uh, gates formed from uh, gems, precious gems. God says they're building blocks for the future. But uh, the self-consciousness of your soul will be constantly discovering new depths of personality that you had. Your volition that is going to be still operating, apparently, will be able to make decisions without pressure from the old sin nature, from the world system, from the host of old uh, satanic beings. And one of the greatest things is that so will the souls of everybody else that's going to be there be finally perfected so you don't have to put up with all the stupid idiosyncrasies of the idiots that are your friends and neighbors and relatives today. Isn't that wonderful? Not that you have that many idiots. I have. Uh, I mean, I'm married in a lovely family, but my wife got stuck with a bunch of nit. Some of my relatives, well, none of them have ever hung by their neck, but I have a few that I might have hung by their tail. I don't know. Uh, no, we, we don't believe in evolution in our family, although there are doubts when you look at some of my uncles. But uh, the concepts, the concept of uh, the fact that we'll have fantastic ability to fellowship with other believers when the old sin nature has been eliminated. You know, there's some people that when you meet them, you don't like them. After you get to know them, you hate them. Well, that's the way it is because of the old sin nature. However, think of it in the eternity future, fantastic fellowship. Now, first, fourthly, eternity is not a stationary community, but an entirely different sphere of living where there are actually no restrictions which are placed upon your blessing and your development. So you can have, you can develop and keep on developing for all of eternity. And you can receive blessing upon blessing for all of eternity as God pours these things out. Fifthly, there will be no 24-hour days. See, we have 24-hour days today. And uh, uh, that means that uh, they're limited. But no 24-hour days in eternity future which tells us that we have unlimited time uh, in eternity for us for the, to uh, go through this development and to this blessing. Sixthly, uh, when God gives you a personality, you notice He never changes that personality. He doesn't change it when you're saved. He never eradicates the chief personality changes or characteristics that He has given to you and nor does he ever change your nature. He changes the old sin nature by removing it. But your nature is, does, isn't changed. And so uh, you're going to be fundamentally the same. If you're a, uh, a warm, passionate type person, uh, you'll be warm and passionate in eternity future. If you're a fiery type, you'll be a fiery type. If you're the laid back type in, in, in eternity future, you'll be laid back. You'll be that type of a person. Uh, uh, the fiery person is going to become cold and dispassionate and vice versa. There's not a stereotype personality. So the, your personality will be free to be all that God intended for it to be. And just think of the diversity of uh, intellect, of tastes, of abilities, of interests and likes. By means of deduction, we can conclude that in eternity, there will be at least as great a variety of activities to utilize our intellect our tastes, our ability, 
And if remember, beloved, if there's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb, there has to be eating in eternity future. Something has to be put on the table. It ought to be something great. Talk about a cruise. Somebody said, take a cruise. You have the best meal. They have meals all the time. Nothing compared to, to eternity future. The marriage supper of the Lamb. It's going to last a thousand years. It's going to be great. I sure hope that the lobster and the uh, shrimp are at my near end of the table. But uh, what do you like? I suppose some of you to, uh, who to, to down here have de developed your tastes no more than for uh, fast foods or pizza will, will finally uh, taste some things that are good. I don't know. But uh, anyway, um, one, of the, one of the saddest expressions that can be spoken today is if I only had the chance to I believe in heaven that you will have that chance. Uh, I know uh, some of us would like to be able to play a musical instrument, not a harp. Maybe some of you like to play a harp, but a musical instrument. I'd like to be able to play, sit down and play that, you know. They've got a fix. They could, you hit buttons on this and it does everything except play the melody. You have to learn how to play the melody with one hand. Man, I was just fooling around with it today. It can... It does, it whistles, it sings, it hums, it almost turns somersaults. It's a beautiful little thing. The keys stick a little bit, but it's got a lot. It can do almost anything. And it has music everywhere from the begin to rock. Waltz. Oh, it's got all kinds of rhythms that it can play. It does all those keys, but you still have to play. And I can't do that. But I have a feeling, you see, when I finally get to heaven, the Lord will let me play the tuba in in the heavenly band. I've always wanted to play a tuba. I, of course, you see, I don't have high aspirations. You understand? I don't have high aspirations. I've, I'm satisfied with the little things, or just to play an old tuba. Uh, but I'll play it uh, magnificently in the heavenly band. I look forward to that, you know. But whatever it is, what are the, your talents, your ability. Uh, apparently in heaven there will be perpetual progress and advance in the expansion of all the faculties that God has given to us. Uh, the ability to uh, explore new worlds, uh, new planets, to, to, to uh, uh, even to share some of the intellect of some of the great people who have lived and already have gone on to be with the Lord. I often you think uh, of, of my friend Stanley Anderson. Uh, whatever Stanley bought, he fixed. He, he improved. Uh, if he bought a, uh, a trailer, uh, it wasn't very long before he was improving it. It wasn't right when he bought it. I wonder what he did when he got to heaven when everything was all right to begin with. <laughs> I'm going to ask him when I get there. I'm going to ask Stanley when I get there. What did you do, Stanley? Did you walk in and say, I think this throne room could use some a little... <laughs> well, in other words, heaven is not a static place. Now, we do know, according to Revelation chapter 19, 1, that the major occupation will be with the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Turn to Revelation chapter 19, 1. Now we're going to start looking at some specific examples. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah. Hallelujah is the Hebrew word which means praise the Lord. That's all it means. Yah is the word for Jehovah, the last for, uh, syllable. And uh, hallelujah is praise to Jehovah or praise the Lord. So hallelujah simply means praise the Lord. Then it goes on to quote what this heavenly group is shouting. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are His judgments, 
He has condemned the great prostitute, that is religion, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And he goes on to talk about the 24 elders, that the representation of believers of this church age, cried hallelujah. And verse 5, the voice from the throne said, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both small and great. And it continues, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. That's the church. That's you and me. You and me, we're the bride. The body becomes the bride. The royal family becomes the bride. He's the bridegroom. The wedding of the Lamb has come. The bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clear, was given for her to wear. And the wedding will take place because we will be in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we will forever and ever and ever be with the Lord. When Handel's Messiah was performed for the first time, in front of the king and queen of England it progresses as you know from the prophecies of the Old Testament through to his birth his death and resurrection and his the time of his anointing as the king of kings and the Lord of Lords and comes the great the great portion called the Hallelujah Chorus. And uh, it, when it begins, as it begins, it begins with the instruments and then the chorus comes in and uh, uh, it, it talks about Hallelujah, Hallelujah. As it began to unfold and the words became clear, and he shall reign forever and ever. The king and queen realized suddenly that they were in the presence of royalty. And in their box, they stood to their feet. And the audience, of course, looked and saw. And they began all over the audience to stand follow the leadership of the king and queen and to this day it is the policy it is the custom whenever the hallelujah chorus is sung the audience rises to its feet in recognition of the king of kings and the lord of lords and he shall reign forever and ever king of kings and lord of lords Well, I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ will personally be on his feet to welcome you to heaven, just as he was when he welcomed Stephen in the 8th chapter of the book of Acts. When Stephen was stoned to death, he looked up into heaven and he had a vision that you and I don't have. Sometimes there have been people who have been on the verge of death and Somehow they've looked into eternity future and and they've seen something and they don't you they haven't said anything and and suddenly there's a smile that appears on their face and they're gone and you think maybe it is that they got just a glimpse of the Savior standing waiting to welcome them and I believe there's going to be a great big hug for all of us when we walk in over that high golden bridge and Placed around us will be those nail-scarred hands. D.M. Moody said, <laughs> you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sit down and look at Jesus for the first thousand years. He said, then I'm going to say, now, where's Paul? <laughs> and we who are believers are occupied with the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the object of our greatest ad, uh, admiration, but, you know, uh, in eternity future, when we shall actually see him face to face. He says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, that 
He says, uh, Dear friends, now we are the children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And if He today is the object of our, of our uh, uh, occupation, What will it be like when we actually see him face to face? The story is told of a, of a woman who was born blind. And she had just about given up hope, but her family convinced her that she should go and see a specialist. And the specialist said, Ma'am, I believe, I believe that we have finally developed the, ter the technology which will make it possible through surgery for you to be able to see. And so she agreed to the surgery. And, of course, when the bandages were to come off, the family gathered around, you know, and a few minutes before she would see for the first time, someone said to her, Margaret, What's the first thing you want to see? What's the first thing you want to look at? Well, of course, everybody thought she'd say, well, her husband, the man she loved and was married to, or those, the tiny children that God had blessed her with in her family that she'd never seen. And she said, no. First of all, I want to see the man who made it possible for me to see. We all will want to behold our loved ones, loved and friends, but the first one we want to see when we enter into eternity future will be the one of whom the psalmist said, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none on earth that I desire beside thee. Now, finally, we'll have the opportunity to express to him how we really feel. But once that's finished, think of the fantastic fellowship which we shall have. In the same uh, chapter of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 19... First, well, I, I, I've written Revelation 19, 19, but that doesn't seem to be the verse uh, that I have. But uh, let me let, look at verse 17 and 18. I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice, Come gather for the great supper of God. And I think that this supper is going to be one of great fellowship. And I've, uh, I, I apparently have written the wrong verse that I wanted to write in my notes here. I have to correct that. I better mark it off. I'll check it out. Sometimes my typewriter makes mistakes. <laughs> Terrible. But let's try Hebrews 12:23. See if that's correct. Well, yes, uh, verse 22 and 23. You have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks of a better word than the blood of Abel. Think of the fellowship that we're going to have. Think of the joy uh, in, Ma in Matthew chapter 8, the Lord Jesus made an interesting statement. Matthew 8, 11. The Lord Jesus uh, 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 said, uh, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob 
in the kingdom of heaven. Well, uh, just think of that for a moment. He's talking about uh, uh, sitting down with some of these great Bible saints. Uh, I recall the first time I, as a Roman Catholic teenager, was invited to the little Methodist church down the street. And I went into a youth meeting, and they started talking about a book that I had never heard of. I'd have heard, I heard the Missal, I heard of the prayer book, but I never heard of the Bible in all the years I was in church. And they started talking about Adam and Eve, and I hadn't the slightest idea who Adam and Eve were, believe it or not. How could a person get to be that age and not hear about Adam and Eve? But I didn't know who they were. And when they started talking about them in the Garden of Eden, it piqued my curiosity, and that's what started my road to redemption. I had never heard about such a book. And the more these people talked about this book, the more and more it, it, it piqued my curiosity. And I said, I've got to find out what this book is that talks about all these people. And it, there it was that I began my quest. And it wasn't many uh, days afterwards that uh, I was led to come to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I began to study the Word of God. And all of us who have been studying the Word of God have certain favorites in the Word of God. I'm sure there aren't many who have a favorite like I do. Uh, Phineas, is, Phineas is one of my favorites. Maybe say, what a stupid name. Well, I don't care about his name being stupid or not, but he was an interesting character. Phineas happens to be a, a favorite of mine, and I want to meet Phineas because... When everybody else was worshiping the golden calf, not Phineas, he was going around knocking off a few heads. He was slaying a few of those birds who were worshiping the calf. I like that. I like a guy like that. And I, have, I plan on having a little chat with Phineas someday. There are other favorites of mine. I like Titus, old hard-nosed Titus. Uh, Timothy uh, never has appealed to me. Timothy, though my middle name is after Timothy... Uh, I think he was named after my, I was named after my uncle, the drunkard, not after the Timothy of the Bible. Timothy of the Bible was a, a weak sister. Uh, he didn't have much backbone. But Titus was like Paul, tough, tough and, as nails. And I want to meet, I want to meet him. Okay, but just think of the, think of the great joy that we shall have. Every time I get the Moody Alumni News I read through, this, the first place I turn is present with the Lord. Shows you you get up in years. Okay, you look at this. Present with the Lord details all those who, since the last issue, that they know of who have been promoted to glory. And uh, it's amazing how many that uh, I see there who have been promoted to glory, that have gone on before me. But uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful friends uh, don't become my best friend because if you do, You'll probably be promoted to glory. That always happens. <laughs> All my best friends are in heaven. I have to wait till I get there to see them again. But uh, uh, to catch up, think of it. And no gossip. Won't that be great? <laughs> All those wonderful things. But uh, one of the things I know, uh, uh, Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer. Uh, said that uh, if you if, if you're walking around heaven and you hear all hail the power of Jesus name by a male chorus that's Lewis Berry Chafer with all the uh, the Dallas uh, uh, seminary alumni <laughs> uh, uh, there singing uh, under his leadership all hail the power of Jesus and he repeatedly said that in heaven one of the things that he wants to do is to lead all the Dallas alumni in singing all hail the power of Jesus' name. Uh, one of the things that, as those of us who are uh, Moody alumni, we'll all get together, and even though the new students won't know the song, we'll sing, God bless the school that D.L. Moody founded. Firm may she stand, though by foes of truth surrounded. Riches of grace bestowed, may she never squander. Keeping true to God and man, her record over yonder. Glory over yonder. Well, anyway, <laughs> you almost, 
Because, see, the problem is I can't sing it here on earth. Every time I get together with a group of alumni and start singing, I choke up. Maybe in heaven I won't choke up when I sing that glorious song together. And that's the next thing. There's going to be music in heaven. And bless your heart, some of you who can't carry a tune in a, music, in a bushel basket are going to be able to sing. Psalm 144.9 tells us that we will all sing a new song uh, uh, unto God. Psalm 150 indicates that there are going to be trumpets and organs and pianos, stringed instruments, loud cymbals. Oh, golly, I hope it isn't rock and roll. Look, percussion instruments. There probably will be some of that. And they'll be in tune, believe it or not. Isn't that something? Rock of ages. Roll, Jordan, roll. That'll be the rock and roll in heaven anyway. <laughs> Franz Joseph Haydn. Is called the father of the symphony. He wore himself out writing two great oratorios, one of which is called Creation. 